Hello everyone and welcome back to Solar System Tourism in Kerbal Space Program 1.8.1 with Realism Overhaul where I send my Twitch livestream audience to their preferred destination, providing that they pay for the in-stream currency struts, which they earn by watching. We begin with a lunar mission to our lunar gateway for Miku Singularity, who was the paying customer in this case, and accompanying Miku was Berlin, a generic Kerbal. And we were launching on the Nisei Mono, which is a sort of Japanese spin on SLS, if you will. If uh, SLS was made with Japanese hardware, we've got the boosters from the H2 rocket uh, down there, the SRBAs, I believe. And then on the core, we have a total of eight LE7 engines. Uh, so those are the engines off of the H2 rocket. And they were in clusters of two, so you'll only see four engines in the staging there. And then on the upper stage, we have the LE5 engines as our upper stage engines and a set of four of them, just like on EUS. So uh, in this case, we had to have 12 of the SRBAs to get the same kind of thrust we would have gotten from the two SRBs on SLS. And here they go off. Well, very vigorous separation with the Separatrons there. And we continue on. We are also carrying supplies to the station in the form of modules that are used on the HTV, but ultimately the capsule on top is just a Lynx, and so that was the simplest choice I figured. And so off goes the core, and here we have the four LE5 engines. The name of the rocket, Nisemono, means fake in Japanese. It's basically a fake SLS, uh, though, you know, Conceptually is as real as SLS, but of course SLS is actually launched, so it isn't quite that real. And we reignite the engines for our transfer to the moon, and we have plenty of Delta V to spare 520, and we could have used that to help us out. And that's why I separated some of the fairing panels first to get sunlight and carry it along, but it didn't work out. I think we had limited ignitions on those engines, so we couldn't use them. I'm not too sure why we were spinning so much, but that might have been another problem. In any case, we ignited the AJ-10-190s on this service module and completed the mid-course adjustment that we were trying to do there. Uh, possibly the le 5 would just have been too strong to do that correction and the RCS not good enough. But we had another problem. We didn't have the RCS on the supply stage working right. And so that meant that we wouldn't be able to dock at the station correctly and we're going to need some help. So we only have the RCS on the link spot itself which is not good enough to do the docking. So here we are matching speeds with our station in multiple burns. It wasn't just one burn but there's a lot of Delta V around the moon that we're using to get to the Lunar Gateway and that's because it wasn't the right time of the month to rendezvous with no Lunar Gateway. Because of Lunar Gateway's high orbit, there's a particular time in each month that would be optimal and this was not one of those times. So anyway, I sent a module from the station out to grab our spacecraft and pull it in. I emptied it of the food, water, and oxygen it originally carried. So the food, water, and oxygen you see there is in the supply container the HTV style supply container on the spacecraft. And here we are coming into dock. And so Miku Singularity did end up on the station. And so did our supplies. And all was well. So I sorted everything out with Ship Manifest. And then we could proceed to the next mission, which was a another lunar mission. Except this time it was Pekka who wanted to land on the lunar surface. I decided to use the Blue Origin cabin, you might have remembered this from the old Blue Origin national team lander, but attach it to the orange, which is actually supposed to drop off uh, base modules on the moon. In this case, it's being used as a lander stage. And by request of Pekka, I believe, we are launching on Falcon Heavy. I don't think he really wanted to use the Blue Origin cabin with Falcon Heavy, uh, but I impose that upon him. So, Falcon Heavy launch, many engines. Down here, the plumes don't look great, but once we get to higher altitude, it looks okay. And the plumes sort of interfere with each other just like the real plumes do. So, that's a bonus for real plumes, so that, that sort of effect. Of course, we have to throttle down the core in order to make sure it concluded later than the boosters. 
and I use engine groups controller which comes with realism overhaul for that and then the fairings off. This is Kartoffel Kuchin's Falcon Heavy, part of the launchers pack from KK, KK launchers pack and completing orbit. Now the upper stage of the Falcon Heavy will not be able to do the entire burn to the moon so we have a tiny little stage underneath the orange in order to uh, finish up that business and start us off on the capture. Unfortunately, I once again had things on the wrong node as it turns out. And so when I tried to separate off the stage, it didn't separate. And I, I just wasn't used to using this particular adapter that comes with this mod. I mean, that's not a payload fairing or anything like that with the two nodes. I didn't realize that the top node of that wasn't the right one to decouple off of. So. Once again, we had our Kerbal blow up parts. See that payload adapter? I thought I was putting it on the right node, but turns out not so much. So, well, at least we have a Kerbal to take care of that. Pika did all that business. And then we have the next stage, this little extra stage. And you might have noticed the resources there. Uh, beryllium fluoride, lithium fluoride, li liquid ammonia, liquid fluorine, and pentaborine. Those are the propellants of the Raidernik Special which is based on a Russian design. The original design was pentaborane NTP, but there was an alternate version that had this uh, combination of five propellants. And I fill around in RPA light in order to figure out what the balance would be. And that's the result with this engine, the Raidernik Special. And it has the benefit of having very dense propellants, even though it gets more than 400 seconds of ISP. So instead of having the low density of hydrogen and oxygen, uh, the downside is these are all very corrosive, dangerous propellants, pentaborane and liquid ammonia and liquid fluorine especially. Um, yeah. Anyway, so we separate that off and we have the final phase of landing with the orange. Uh, the orange is just methane and oxygen. And the downside to the Radiant Special is limited ignitions and not, no throttling, so we wouldn't be using that for landing anyway. And here we go, up, up, up. too much thrust there, started going up. It's really hard to get this down. After all, the cabin is not that heavy. By necessity of the original design. And we land safely. Those are Gemini, light Gemini lander landing legs from FASA. The little nose on the cabin is to counterbalance the solar panel in the back. So, because I didn't want another solar panel in front blocking the windows or anything like that. Pekka was aiming to get the most badges in Final Frontier at this point. And now we have to launch something to go get him because that lander is just a lander and it can't come back to Earth. And the Sajita rocket sort of clips into its structure there, but the structure doesn't have colliders so it's alright. That was a little bit of a mishap, but sort of one that I knew could happen because of how close everything is right there. And the Sajita rocket is one of my old designs. It's methane and oxygen, five engines, each core, identical uh, boosters. Uh, it's, it's complicated. There is uh, logic to it that allows for mass production, but I'd have to get into that and I don't want to right now. But the core expends. For some reason I have a lot of sideways motion in this video. Uh, 1,000 kilonewtons each for the engine, and it's the same engine on the upper stage, just like a Falcon sort of situation, except there's only five engines on the cores. And this one is a vacuum optimized one with an extendable nozzle. And off goes that upper stage, and again, sort of the sideways motion, but this time we have a problem. This time I can't stop the sideways motion uh, for some reason. I don't understand why, I don't remember what the issue was, and ultimately uh, thankfully there were no Kerbals on board, so I got to just get rid of it. I, mean, I didn't think that I could solve the problem. It was just constantly spinning and nothing I could do uh, changed that, including saving and loading again. Because I have persistent rotation, time warping doesn't work. So, yeah. I decided to send something else, something reliable, and I went with Apollo. Apollo is always reliable. I didn't go with a Saturn V rocket though, instead I took the S2 stage, the one with five J2 engines on it, and I made it long. Uh, made it a 6.6 .6 meter long stage and put SRBs on it. These are the UA-1563s I believe. 
and so they're very powerful SRBs. So this configuration is sort of similar. It's like a small SLS in a way, uh, except it's more like a Titan. Well, it's complicated because we're laying the core in mid-air. We're not laying it on the ground. So uh, a mix of things. So the boosters were the only ones lit on the ground and they separate here after I make sure that they are low enough thrust and the uh, five J2s continue to bring us to orbit or sh shy of orbit. The S4B stage will complete orbit with its one J2 engine. These are probably J2Ss, uh, so slightly uprated J2 engines. Not exactly uprated, they, they had substan substantial differences, but we'll gloss over that for now. And once we make orbit, we have just a little bit less than the amount that we need to transfer over to the moon, so the service module will complete that. And here is our transfer burn beginning. So, it's sort of Apollo-ish, but not exactly Apollo-ish. I mean, certainly this is just the normal Apollo spacecraft with a Apollo service module and the standard Apollo service module engine. And we have lots of Delta V because we're not carrying the lunar module to the moon. And here I had overburned for some reason, I don't remember if that was intentional or not, but we have this huge correction here. And if I that wasn't intentional, then I probably would have pulled it back uh, earlier instead of doing a mid-course correction that costed that much. I think the goal was to make sure that we had the right inclination to intercept the target. And so you can see we're aiming for that. And that allows the lander to get to us a little bit easier. So the lander ascends, making sure that the timing is right to intercept with the Apollo command module, command and service module. Uh, one of the issues was that we had to get there, get here quickly because Pekka's food, water, and oxygen would otherwise diminish. It looks like he had plenty though, but just in case, we can't take too long. So, here we are rendezvousing with the target. We did, we used all the fuel we needed to, of course. And one other problem is that the Apollo command module doesn't have the same docking port that this has. It can't fit a docking port like this. So Pekka has to EVA out to the Apollo command module, but that's fairly simple. No big problems there. And after that, we dispose of this little weird orange lander. Clearing the Apollo spacecraft, of course. And there we go. It will smash into the lunar surface and we can bring Pekka back. This was a highly inclined orbit, and so this sort of odd trajectory out was the most convenient one. And we made sure to separate off the service module before hitting the atmosphere this time, unlike in the previous video. And I did that with a lot of time to spare there because of what happened in the previous video. And here we are coming into the atmosphere using the off-center center of mass to get some lifting re-entry goodness in, making sure that we get down on one pass, and also that we limit g-forces. So this position to limit g-forces, the upside down position in order to make sure that we come down quickly. And so Pekka cruising right along. The downside is I wasn't really aiming to hit water. I mean, most of the time, if you don't do anything, you'll still hit water. But as it turns out, we ended over the desert. And so Pekka, well, he's going to have a little bit of a rough landing. But that's that. At least he got back safely. In the next video, we will turn away from all this lunar nonsense and focus on interplanetary missions. But for now, thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below. And I'll see you next time.